So when I first entered uh, full-time church ministry, I was nervous. I felt anxious. Like ministry is what I felt called to my entire life. And here I was finally doing what I felt get, that God had called me to do and given the responsibilities of spiritual leadership and caring for a congregation. And I was terrified. I had imposter syndrome. I had somehow tricked this church into believing that I was competent, when in reality, I had no idea what I was doing. And so I put so much pressure on myself to like try and be like, quote unquote, successful, like whatever that means in a church. And I couldn't even sleep at night. I was struggling with insomnia. So I was meeting with this woman named Sue Pinkusoff, who is a spiritual director, and I was sharing with her about my anxiety and my sleeplessness. And I'll always remember how she looked at me just directly in the eyes with this really compassionate gaze. And she said to me, Christine, whatever you do, always remember that you are a worshiper first. Always remember that you are a worshiper first. She shouldn't say you need to be a worshiper or you need to try harder to worship God. She said, you are a worshiper first. You were made to worship God. It's at the core of who you are. It's at the very core of your being. In the Presbyterian Church, they have this thing called the Heidelberg Confession, and it talks about the chief end of man, like humankind. And it says that the chief end of human beings is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. The chief end of human beings is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. So all human beings worship. All human beings worship something. The difference between a Christian and an atheist is not that one worships and the other doesn't. The difference lies in the object of their worship, the focus of their love, their devotion, their energies in their lives, what it is that captures their imaginations. Everyone worships something. So our gospel reading this morning is really one of my favorite passages in scripture. And each of the four gospels has some version of this story, which highlights it in its importance. So some of the deep details may differ, like the location, whose house it's at. In Luke's account, Jesus is at the home of a Pharisee, and it's a sinful woman who anoints him, weeping as she does so. In John's account of this story, as we read, they're in Bethany, and it's Mary who anoints him. In Matthew and Mark's account, Jesus adds this statement where he says, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. But the general arc of the story is the same, that there's a woman who comes to Jesus with an expensive jar of, per of perfume and anoints Jesus's feet and wipes them with her hair. There's criticism from someone about this extravagant act of worship and then Jesus defends and honors her for what she has done. So that's true, that we are all worshipers first who worship something. And as Christians, if it's the chief end of our lives truly to worship God and enjoy God forever, what might this story have to tell us about what that means? Well, first of all, worship is wholehearted. Worship is wholehearted. So Mary left nothing on the table. Her worship was extravagant and raw and intimate to the point of being embarrassing, honestly, and at risk of criticism. Like to pour out perfume worth a year's worth of wages. Think about how much you make in a year. A year's worth of wages in one act of worship to the disciples and those watching was unconscionable. But Mary didn't care, or rather, she did care deeply, just not about the opinions of others. And her vision in this moment was of Jesus, and of Jesus alone, the absolute center of her devotion, worthy of her all, and then some. 
So the poet David White talks about a time in his life when he was running a large nonprofit organization and he was just completely exhausted, just spent at the end of himself, running on empty. He talks about how one night he was talking to his friend, the Benedictine monk, um, David Stendel Rost, and he just said to him, Brother David, tell me about exhaustion. And Brother David said, you know that the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. The antidote to exhaustion is wholeheartedness. You are so tired through and through because you are only half here and half here will kill you after a while. You need something to which you can give your full powers. Now, what Brother David was saying was not that David White needs to try harder, like you're not giving your full self to your work, so like get it together, get focused, you know, just try harder. Rather, he was saying that the reason why he was so stressed and tired, he's saying, you know, you've lost your way. You've lost the center, the ground of your life and your heart, and you need to get back to that, that place that matters the most to you. Who matters the most to you? He was saying God made you to be wholehearted, not half-hearted. Kierkegaard said that purity of heart will one thing. And at another dinner with the same family, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. Only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the better part. The Apostle Paul in our epistle reading today, where he says, this one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining towards what a, what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize that God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And this is really what the journey has been that we've been on in Lent, right? Like in what ways have our hearts become half, or divided? distracted. Like even as a priest, you know, my vocation is about Jesus being at the center. And even I can lose sight of what it means to be a worshiper first, where the ministry becomes first, or whether or not I'm being effective becomes first, or having like a perfect liturgy where you never make mistakes becomes first. You know, what other people think of me comes first. And Jesus is saying, Christine, all I want is you. All I want is your heart, even when it's your struggling heart or your broken heart um, or your angry heart or your grieving heart. All I want is you. So worship is wholehearted as God has created us to be wholehearted. But secondly, worship sets us free from what binds us. It sets us free. So right before this story in John chapter 11 is the famous story about Jesus raising Mary's brother Lazarus from the dead. And the two stories are really one story. The great New Testament scholar, Kirsten Swanson, writes about this moment of anointing Jesus. She writes, Mary is acting as a prophet, performing a sign of things to come. Her prophetic actions mark a transition in the Gospel of John. The stench of death from Lazarus's tomb becomes perfumed fragrance. What is bound becomes unbound, and death becomes life. The dead were always bound in grave clothes. And the first words that Jesus says after he raised Lazarus from the dead is, unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. And in John 12, there is another unbinding. It's, Jesus, it's Mary's unbound hair that she uses to wipe Jesus's feet. And in the ancient world, the unbound hair of a woman, as Kirsten writes, is a symbol of another, a number of things. It can mean thankful veneration of a God. It can mean freedom. It can mean devotion. It can mean grieving. And in light of that, all of these things can apply to Mary's act of worship. 
What kind of woman in the ancient world can walk into a room of men and do what she did with such wholeheartedness? A woman whose heart has been set free by the one she heard say, Lazarus, come forth, and saw her dead brother emerge from the grave. And we don't get insight into what Mary was like before this moment, but that moment typifies what happens when you encounter Jesus. You hear him say, Lazarus, come forth. Mary, come forth. Christine, come forth. And he calls you forth from the darkness, from the grave, from your bondage, from your fears, from death, and sets you free. And when we worship, we are enacting that freedom that we have found in Christ. And when we worship, we proclaim that fear and death no longer have any hold us. So worship is wholehearted. Worship sets us free. And finally, worship will break your heart. If there is grief that is mingled in this act of love, and how could it be any other way, right? Like to love is to grieve. To love is to suffer. Just ask any parent who has stood over the bed of their sleeping child, like their heart bursting with love, and at the same time feeling this sense of fear that, like, I can't protect my child from hurt or harm in this world. To love is to grieve. And that's why so many of us are afraid of love and we end up settling for some pale imitation of it. But Mary sees what the disciples cannot see or refuse to see in this moment. And that's that the one that they worship and follow is not only the Messiah, the one that they follow will be a crucified Messiah. And so Jesus says, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have, but you will not always have me. Like Jesus is obviously not being calloused here and saying, like, well, just don't care about the poor. What he's saying is that for this king, this journey to Jerusalem will end at the cross. And Mary is with him. She's preparing him for it. And he loves her for that act of devotion. You know, every time that Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to suffer and die, like they just don't get it. They just don't get it. They can't accept it. And Peter goes so far as to rebuke Jesus for that, but not Mary. You know, worship is not about getting like whipped up into some sort of ecstatic religious fervor that then disconnects you so you can forget about the reality of the world. The worship is eyes wide open, and it actually connects you even more deeply with heartbreaking clarity of the poignancy and the vulnerability of what it means to be human in this broken world of ours. And to worship is to consent to have your heart broken with the things that break the heart of God and to worship still to worship still. Now, anointing the head of the king with oil was not unusual. That was what you did when a king was being consecrated. But what was unusual is anointing the feet. Mary is always the one who's at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, falling before him in grief, and now kneeling before him to wipe this anointing oil on his feet, this prophetic act that harkens back to Genesis 3, when the Lord tells the serpent in the garden, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And she uses her unbound hair, this, her glory, 
the symbol of her freedom, to anoint the feet of her king as he readies himself to be struck by the serpent with a wound that takes his very life from him in order to take on the sins of the world, your sins, my sins, unto himself to heal us, and to free us, to call forth from the grave into life. And as we worship like Mary, the scent of that perfume just fills the room and it spills out into a world full of the smell of death so that we can serve and wash and anoint and apply the healing salve of God's love to its wounds. The next Sunday begins Holy Week. This is the, the most sacred year of the church's calendar. And it's really not about just like a bunch of religious services to go to for the sake of being religious, for the ritual. It's really about pilgrimage. It's about journeying with Jesus in path, in passion, his suffering, his death and resurrection. And to encounter these realities in the here and now, or the here and now, and allow ourselves to be formed and transformed by them. So what would that look like for us to prepare our hearts for this holiest of weeks and to live into who we are as worshipers first, who worship our King wholeheartedly instead of just half here, who worship enacting the freedom that we have in Christ, hearts unbound so that we can worship and allow our hearts to be broken with the things that break the heart of God and holding them with Jesus, bringing them to the foot of the cross so that they might be healed. I just invite us now to just bow our heads for a moment, and just, just to take a moment. And just imagine yourself before Jesus. Maybe there's people around in this image, but in this moment, it is just you and Jesus alone. And just imagine your heart like this alabaster jar, this alabaster jar of perfume. And you're coming before Jesus to break this jar. And maybe that's how you feel this woman, this morning, like you have a broken heart. How can you let even your broken heart just be poured out before the Lord right now? Bring your whole heart to God, whatever it is. How might God just be illuminating your heart? In what ways have you been just half here, you know, holding pieces of your heart in fear or in anxiety or in stress or whatever it may be? And how might you return to God with that whole heart? Where is your heart just feeling bound and dead and broken this morning? And can you hear the voice of Jesus saying to you, just come forth, just come out of the darkness into the light, come out from the stench of death into this perfumed fragrance of life. Come and just be free and be healed by my love. Let your heart be set free 
this morning. And in what ways this morning might actually the invitation be to let your heart be broken and to know that that's okay, that it's okay to give yourself to that heartbreak and to let yourself feel what you feel and to cry the tears that you need to cry. And maybe it's something in your life Maybe it's something in the life of someone you love. Maybe it's just the state of our world that it's in. But to allow worship, to just open your eyes to the full reality and to know that, that Jesus knows this heartbreak and that Jesus knows the grief and the suffering, that he's felt it sorrow and love flow mingled down so how can we not just live in this illusion or protect our hearts but actually entrust our hearts to god as we worship and knowing that through it all through it all that he is still god that god is still god and we can worship him still even in the midst of that wholehearted, free, hearts broken and open to you, God. That is what we long for, Lord. And God, we walk this journey with you, Jesus. God, give us vision to see you and you only, God, to not just be half here, but to be wholly here with all of who we are at your feet, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for freeing us. Thank you for calling us your own. We worship you. Thank you. 